There are actually four different collective properties. The first one is actually freezing point lowering, the boiling point elevation, vapor pressure decreasing, and the fourth one is calculation of the osmotic pressure. Here, I'm going to use the freezing point lowering as uh, examples, and then you will need to derive this by yourself. So when we talk about the freezing point, let me define a few terms. Component A is your solvent. Component B is your solute. At equilibrium, the things you can always write is actually your mu liquid is going to be equal to your mu solid. Assuming today we have ideal solution, then you can actually write your mu liquid as mu liquid star. Here I want to specify this mu liquid is for your solvent, right? So I write down mu liquid solvent plus uh, T natural log, more fractions of your solvent. And then it's going to be equal to the chemical potentials at the solid phase. I'm going to move this thing to the right so I can have RT natural log. XA is going to be equal to your mu S star minus your mu liquid star. This actually represents the delta G or the change of chemical potentials for the freezing steps, right? Because your final step is actually solid, initial step is actually your liquid. So this is going to represent your delta mu of freezing. Move the temperature to the right hand side. Okay, so this is actually what I want to have. The reason I want to have this is because previously we actually introduced you this gibbs helens hoff equation. If you do partial mu over T, partial T, it's going to equal to negative delta H over T squared. The reason I want to do this is because when we talk about these phase transitions, most of the time people give you the delta H of freezing, right? People actually did not give you delta G of freezing. So if you want to change this guy into delta H, right now you have this over T, right? Which is actually this term. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to do the partial derivative on both sides with respect to T. So that on the right hand side of the equation is going to give us delta H over T squared terms. Once you have this, the next thing you do is actually you do the partial derivative with respect to T. So partial natural log XA, partial T is going to equal to 1 over R times partial delta mu F over T, partial T. This term is going to equal to 1 over R times negative delta H of freezing over T squared. On the left hand side, all you get is actually the natural log XA. So once we got to this point, the next step is to integrate over T. If you do this integration over temperature, on the left hand side, what you're going to get is actually natural log xa on the right hand side will be delta h freezing over r times 1 over t minus 1 over t dot the t dot is your normal freezing point so for water of course it will be 0 degree c natural log xa we can actually write this as a natural log 1 minus xp right and then mathematically, if you have natural log 1 minus x, this will simply equal to negative x. So natural log 1 minus xb, this just simply equals to negative xb. So it's going to equal to delta h of freezing over r, 1 over t minus 1 over t dot. So I'm going to move the negative sign to the right hand side. Okay, so once you see these equations, if you look at this on the left hand side, xb is actually a positive number, right? So you know this is actually positive. There's actually a negative sign here. But your delta h of freezing is actually negative. So negative with this negative sign, so this term will be positive. What it means is that this term has to be positive too. What it really means is actually your T has to be smaller than your normal freezing point. So this means 
if today you have increase of the concentration of your solute, then the temperature of your solution will decrease. Here you can see these temperatures, okay, which is the freezing point of the solution, is actually connected to the more fraction of your substance, right? The more of you have, then the temperature of this one is actually go down even more. All right, so any question for this? If not, we're going to move to the next one. So vapor pressure decreasing. If today you have a pure substance, then you know your vapor pressure is going to be PA star, right? If today you have a solution, the vapor pressure of your component A, assuming today you have ideal solution, then your PA will simply equal to your PA star times your XA. The difference between the two will be basically just your PA star minus your PA. And your PA is just this. If you put these things in, you have PA star minus PA star times your XA. And then you have PA star together, one minus your XA. This is actually equals to your XB, right? So it's actually equals to PA star times your XB. So what it means is actually the change of your vapor pressures is actually again related to the concentration of your solute. Okay, so let me emphasize again here, A is actually your solvent, B is your solute. So you can see that the change of the vapor pressures, okay, is actually related to your solute. So the larger the XB, that means the difference between your pure and the non-pure solution, the difference will be bigger. So since actually pure has the highest vapor pressure, right? That means actually if you're dumping more solute, then the vapor pressure of your solvent is going to decrease. Okay, so the very last one, which is actually the most interesting one, the osmotic pressure. Typically, okay, you're going to see two containers. They are actually separate by something called the semi-permeable membrane. If today on the right hand side you have pure water, okay, and then on the left hand side you have your solution, okay, where you're going to have some solute inside your solution. So if you plant together, once they reach equilibrium, they're going to actually have different heights. The height difference between the two was defined as the osmotic pressure pi. What we want to know here is how can we actually express the pi as a function of more fraction of solutes inside your solution. So again, once they reach equilibrium, we can say mu on the left hand side versus mu on the right hand side. Mu left is going to equal to your mu right. We know we can actually express the chemical potential of the solution using mu star plus uh, T natural log A. And then on the right hand side will be just mu star because it's actually pure substance. Once you write the things down, there's actually one more thing you want to be careful because the solution on the left and the solution on the right, they have different pressures. For the solution on the right, assuming you have pressures P, then the solution on the left will be actually your osmotic pressures plus P. On the left hand side, you have some extra pressures. Assuming today we have ideal solution, then we can actually write our natural log A as natural log Xi. So what we're going to have is RT natural log Xa is going to equal to mu star at pressure P minus mu star at pressure pi plus P. What this means is the chemical potentials at different pressures. Mathematically, what it means is actually the pressure dependence of your mu. The pressure dependence of your mu, which actually is partial G, partial P at constant T, we know it's actually equals to its volume. The delta G is simply equals to V delta P. So here, we're going to rewrite this. The difference between the two is going to equal to the partial molar volumes of your solvent times the pressure differences. The difference between the two sides is actually just your osmotic pressure. And then because 
this difference is actually bigger, right? So you know it has to be a negative v star times your pi. So once you have this, then we can rewrite this as natural log 1 minus xp, which is going to equal to negative xp, right? So we're going to replace this terms as rt xp with a negative sign in the front equals to negative v star times pi. Therefore, we can actually express pi is going to equal to xp over your v star times rt. Assuming today you have only one more, so then these things will be just equals to the concentration of your solution times r times t. Okay, so pi equals to crt, which is actually the equation you always see in your uh, Jenkins 2.